everyone welcome to my channel learn to teach in my previous video i had started with the topic of digestive system in humans in which we have learned that the food we eat it passes through the alimentary canal alimentary canal it is a long coiled and muscular tube and so the food canal together with the glands such as the liver the salivary glands and pancreas they form the digestive system then we began learning about the first organ involved in digestion and that is the mouth with teeth and tongue and then we have learned about the first digestive gland that is our salivary gland okay now as we all know that the tongue it helps in swallowing the food so where does the swallowed food go from the mouth so the answer is the esophagus esophagus it is also known as food pipe so hence the swallowed food it passes into the esophagus from the mouth the esophagus it is a long and narrow tube which runs down through the chest to open into the stomach now before moving into the food pipe there is a small common passage for both food and air and that is called pharynx the another name for pharynx is throat and pharynx leads to two passages called the trachea and esophagus trachea is also known as windpipe so the food pipe it runs parallel to the trachea and lies just behind it now since the esophagus and trachea they lie parallel to each other so how does the food decides that it has to move into the food pipe only and not into the wind pipe any guesses for this so it is decided not by the food but by a thin flap of cartilage called the epiglottis which usually covers the trachea while we are swallowing the food and so the food it does not move inside the vent pipe however under certain conditions like swallowing too fast talking or not chewing the food properly some of the food particles may enter the trachea and this may cause the airways to get partially blocked and this is known as choking so the food it moves down the esophagus by peristalsis and what is peristalsis so peristalsis it is the slow wave like movement seen in the walls of esophagus due to the contraction and relaxation of muscles and so peristalsis it occurs throughout the alimentary canal and this slow wave like movement it enables the food to be pushed downward the third organ involved in digestive system is the stomach so after the food pipe the food enters the stomach and stomach it is a thin walled elastic bag it is flattened j shaped and it is the widest part of the alimentary canal and of course it opens into the small intestine now stomach it also contains glands called as the gastric glands which secrete gastric juice and the gastric juice it contains what it contains water hydrochloric acid and enzymes pepsin and renin now the acid which is present in the gastric juice it kills the germs which may have entered along with the food and since the food it is stored in the stomach for about 4 to 5 hours so the hydrochloric acid it also prevents rotting of the food during its long stay in the stomach and of course it activates the enzyme pepsin so the small amount of protein digestion it occurs in stomach because of the enzyme pepsin 
and it converts the proteins into a simpler compound called the peptones okay now the renin enzyme it is found in the gastric juice of infants and so it helps in the digestion of casein casein it is a milk protein which is present in the milk of course and it is converted into curd by the help of the enzyme renin okay now the production of renin in the human body it begins to diminish as one grows old so the stomach it churns the food thoroughly along with the digestive juices and changes into a pulp like thick paste called chyme and the chyme it moves into the first part of the small intestine small intestine is a long highly coiled tube like structure it is about 7 to 7.5 meters in length and the food it remains in the small intestine for about 3 to 5 hours for digestion and absorption now a short upper u shaped part of this small intestine which you can see in the diagram continuing from the stomach it is known as duodenum and duodenum it receives a common duct that brings secretions from both the liver and pancreas in the form of bile and pancreatic juice also the small intestine itself secretes digestive juices now can you tell me why the secretions are poured into the small intestine it is because when the partly digested food reaches the small intestine the juices secreted by the small intestine complete the process of digestion and the secreted juices in the small intestine it consists of enzymes like maltase sucrase lactase peptidase lipase etc now before learning the whole process of digestion in small intestine let us learn about the two digestive glands that is the liver and pancreas so liver is reddish brown in color and it is the largest gland in the body it is situated on the right side of the body below the chest region now the liver it produces a greenish yellow fluid that is the bile which is stored in the gall bladder and what is gall bladder gall bladder is an organ found just below the liver now the bile juice does not contain any enzyme but still it is essential for digestion since it breaks the fats into smaller droplets and this process is known as emulsification so emulsification is a process in which the fats are broken down into smaller substances and why do you think so why is it necessary to break down the fats it is because so that the enzymes could act on them efficiently now let us learn about the last digestive gland that is the pancreas so pancreas it is a large whitish leaf shaped gland situated below the stomach it secretes pancreatic juice which is poured into the duodenum through the pancreatic duct now the pancreatic duct opens into the duodenum by a passage common to that of the gall bladder so the pancreatic juice it contains enzymes called the amylase trypsin lipase and which helps in the digestion of carbohydrates proteins and fats so amylase it act on the starch and convert it into maltose trypsin enzyme converts proteins and peptones into peptides and lipase it acts on the emulsified fats and convert it into fatty acids and glycerol now continuing with the small intestine the second part of the small intestine it is known as jejunum and here no digestion takes place 
then the semi digested food it enters the last part of this small intestine and that is known as ileum so ileum it is a long narrow and coiled tube the inner lining of ileum it contains glands which are known as the intestinal glands and that produce intestinal juice now this contains enzymes like erypsin maltase sucrase and lactase so the last part of the small intestine it is ileum and ileum contains intestinal glands which produce intestinal juice and those intestinal juice have certain enzymes the first enzyme erypsin it acts on the peptides and convert it into amino acids maltase enzyme it converts maltose into glucose and the sucrase enzyme it converts sucrose into glucose and fructose and of course the last enzyme lactase it acts on lactose and convert it into glucose and galactose hence through the action of enzymes the ingested food it is completely digested in the ileum of the small intestine and therefore it is the small intestine where the carbohydrates are broken down into simple sugars such as glucose fats are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol and proteins they are broken down into amino acids now the food is digested so what should be the next step the next step should be absorption of the digested food yes and so the nutrients from the digested food it pass into the blood vessels which are present in the walls of the small intestine so let us learn more about the absorption of digested food in small intestine now absorption means consumption or soaking up right so it is the process by which the digested food molecules are absorbed into the blood stream and then transported to different parts of the body and so does the small intestine have special structures that help in the absorption of digested food the answer is yes the inner lining or else the inner wall of the small intestine it contains a large number of tiny finger like projections which are known as villi each single tiny finger like projection it is known as villus and so what is the function of villi the function of villi is to increase the amount of surface area which is available for the absorption of nutrients each villus transport nutrients to a network of thin and small blood vessels called the capillaries and fine lymphatic vessels known as the lacteals which are close to its surface and so the absorbed substances they are transported via the blood vessels to different organs of the body where they are used to build complex substances such as the surface of the villi it absorbs the amino acids and glucose to pass them into the blood system whereas the fatty acids they pass into the special tubes called the lymph vessels and the vitamins and mineral salts they are mostly soluble in water and they are directly absorbed through the walls of the intestine by the process of diffusion and so the ileum of the small intestine it serves the functions both for the digestion and absorption of the digested food and the food that remains undigested and unabsorbed they pass into the large intestine after absorption of the digested food the next step in the process of nutrition is assimilation assimilation it is the utilization of the digested food or nutrients by the body cells 
so the digested food as it gets absorbed into the blood vessels in the small intestine it is then transported to all parts of the body by these blood vessels hence this whole process is known as assimilation so glucose which is the end product of carbohydrate digestion it is one of the body's preferred source of energy it is required to release energy for various metabolic activities in the cell amino acids which are the end product of protein digestion they are involved in almost every body function including growth and development healing and repair of worn out cells and tissues and they are important for muscle development and strength the last is fatty acids and glycerol they are the end product of fat digestion and they act as reserves of energy and are stored for further use example if glucose isn't available for energy the body uses these stored fatty acids to provide energy to the cells for their activities what happens to the undigested and unabsorbed food material any guesses for this so the undigested food material from the small intestine it enters the large intestine and so the large intestine it is wider than the small intestine but it is shorter in length it is approximately 1.5 meters long and it consists of three regions the cecum the colon and the rectum now what is the function of the large intestine so the large intestine it does not secrete any enzyme but it mainly absorbs water and remaining salts from the undigested food material and then after much water is absorbed the undigested waste matter turns into a semi solid form and that reaches the rectum now the rectum it is the last part of the large intestine it is about 15 cm long and the waste material is stored in the rectum in the form of semi solid feces and then the rectum opens to the outside at the anus it has a circular muscle known as sphincter to keep the anus closed now as soon as the muscle that is sphincter it relaxes the anus opens to eliminate the feces and hence the fecal matter is finally removed from the body through the anus and this process is known as ejection so the definition of ejection is it is the process of eliminating the undigested food through the anus so this was all about the various parts of the digestive system and their functions hope that you all have understood the concept very well please do share your views about the video in the comment section box and don't forget to subscribe my channel learn to teach till then keep learning keep teaching and keep enjoying